Yeah, thank you. You can be seated. Well, what good stuff. You know, it's uh, an honor to get the chance to share with you both in person um, and online. My name is David Griffin, one of the founding pastors here um, of Community Life Church. And I am grateful for this time of year. I know some of you are planning your serve projects right now, getting ready for that. You can see the display out there and connect with us further in that. We are um, in the week two of a series called Bad Words. Um, Casey Coates brought us this series idea a couple of months ago, and it comes from a concept um, given by a guy named Craig Rochelle at Life Church. And uh, when he brought it to us, I was reluctant to kind of support it or endorse this for a couple of reasons. Um, the first one is a slight preference to taking a little bit more of an expositional approach um, to the text. And if you remember before Easter, we took um, um, the 24 hours leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. And, and we took passages of Scripture and kind of broke those down and then found some cross-references. And then right afterwards, we did a series on the Holy Spirit. And they may sound like a topic, but in reality, um, we were taking these giant chunks um, of Scripture from the book of Acts and kind of walking through those. And then we're going to be, after this series, we're going to be talking, um, we're going to be walking through the book of Colossians. And I'm so excited about that. I've already been in working on some of that. Um, but my real objection um, to this preaching series or to preaching this series um, has nothing to do with that. Um, it really has to do that I wanted to avoid the pain. Because I prefer to preach sermons that are a little less convicting to me personally. When I'm honest, I would tell you that the words that come out of my mouth may well be the biggest sin issue that I struggle with to this day. And they say um, that your greatest strength is also your biggest weakness, which may explain why I get paid um, to stand up and run my mouth Sunday after Sunday. Um, but also at the same time, I have caused a great deal of chaos by my words. And some of you may be the same way. Um, because of my words, and I'm just going to be honest with you here, um, I've been arrested uh, because of my smart mouth. Um, I've been kicked out of sporting events. I've been in an embarrassingly public shouting match at a bowling alley with a co-pastor. I'll let you guess which one, and I'll bet you get it right. Uh, I've injured people with reckless comments. I've maligned the reputation of others and myself through gossip. And I've told lies that have damaged my credibility. No telling how far off the rails I would go if I wasn't a pastor. So the same mouth that makes people cry in sermons because they are moved by words can also be used to hurt people and to have them cry for that reason. The same voice that makes people valued and loved by God um, in a sermon can make people feel belittled at a sporting event. And that just doesn't make sense. The same words that can go after sin in order to edify can be organized and delivered in a way that exposes the insecurities of others and damages them, maybe even people in my own family. And all of it comes as a result of my big fat mouth. But I want to be clear, as we talked about last week, the problem is not a mouth problem. It's not a words problem. Ultimately, it's a heart problem. Jesus said several times that the mouth simply speaks or reveals the issue that it exists deep down in my heart. So if you find yourself today, if you're like really impulsive, then you may have a self-control issue in your heart. If you say slanderous things about others, it's very possible that you have like a, a, a jealous heart. And if you say a lot of perverted things, it may just be that you're a pervert. I mean, just to be honest about it, right? Our words serve as a window into our soul. And, and we talked about last week, maybe even worse, not just a window into our soul. It's a governor on our relationships, isn't it? So even if you don't believe in the whole thing of the Bible, you could walk away from here going, you know what? I would be better served by telling the truth. Proverbs 18, 21 says this. It says, there is power of life and death in the tongue. Let me tell you what that means. That means that I have the opportunity to speak life or death all the time. And the question is simply this, do you spend more time speaking life or are you speaking death on a regular basis? That's a question that each and every one of us has to ask yourself. In your home, would your family say that you speak life or you speak death? Which characterizes you more? So last week we um, broached the topic of lying and that was incredibly painful because I thought I was fairly safe to start with because uh, I like to think of myself as a fairly honest person but then the week kind of broke out on me you know I'm um, on Tuesday night uh, my kids and I um, went to a local restaurant and uh, and they give free drinks um, for breakfast and I was sitting there in this place we went through the line and we got to the end and right before I went to um, put in my credit card uh, there put the little chip in there um, I hatched a plan. It took about a second and a half to hatch this plan. And here's what I thought. I put my card in, waited till it said it has been paid for because I was thinking, did I want to drink or did I not want to drink? And so I thought I will solve this a different way. 
pulled the card out and said, oh my goodness, I was going to buy a drink. Now, I thought that it was possible that the person would say that'll be $2.50 and they would make me run my card again. But I also thought it was possible they would say, don't worry about it, which is exactly what happened. And I'm over there getting my Coke. Now, I hesitated as whether or not to tell you this. I'm over there getting my Coke and I'm thinking to myself, you are a liar and you're about to preach on lying. <laughs> now, I know that some of you, it's easy to be condemning on this and whatever, but I know you guys, you, listen, I'm, I, I'm a liar, whatever, but you guys get the water cup and you get Sprite in there. I've seen all those bubbles. So I'm a liar, but you're a thief, okay? You're a thief. That's what I'm saying about you. At least they gave me permission. No, and I'm just telling you, listen, there is nothing harder than walking back into a restaurant and trying to explain to them why as a lying pastor, you need to give them money for a drink you already had. It's weird. Trust me. <laughs> if you've never done it, just know that I have. And then it came to Thursday, and I thought, man, I can't believe I lied the week I'm preaching. And listen, on Thursday night, I found myself telling a half-truth. I organized some, some, some things in a little bit, bit of a different order than they actually happened in in order to make myself look better. And I'm like, I'm a liar. I lied four times last week. I feel like I did better this past week. I only lied two. No, that's a lie. I think I've had those no, three, four. That's four now. Four times right here. But, you know, I mean, here's the problem is I'm convicted because ultimately this is a spiritual matter. How we handle our tongues is a spiritual matter that reveals what's going on inside of our hearts. And if you thought walking out of here last week thinking about, I'm going to lie, I'm going to avoid lying, if you think that was a tough sermon, then just buckle up because this week we're talking about complaining. Mm, yeah, right. <laughs> but remember, when we're talking about our mouths, we're really addressing our hearts. When This is the question, what does my complaining and criticizing and general negativity say about the condition of my heart. We are so good at it. And if you don't believe we're good at complaining, then you have never spent any time on the Facebook page, We Are Forney. <laughs> Any you ever been on this? Yeah, so this last week I went in and perused it, and holy cow, we live a, a beautiful suburban life in an amazing state in a fantastic country, and you would think we live in a war-torn, horrible place, right? But no. Now, the administrator of this, of this account tries to make positive comments about all the positive things that are happening in Forney, um, but even when they, they put a positive thing on there, it turns into a complaint box. It's like just one after another comes flying in. And, and so I went through some of the things, and I wrote them down. Um, we complain about restaurants and their poor service. Um, we complain about people who don't put their buggies back in the cart return stall at grocery stores, and those people should be complained about, mind you. Uh, uh, too many nail salons, dentists, and uh, donut shops. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you've seen that one? You know, <laughs> which makes sense, right? Because if you're going to have more donut shops, you've got to have more dentists. That's how it works. Um, uh, building too many houses. They're building too many houses. I mean, your house wasn't one of them, but I know that. I mean, wait, let me ask. How many of you have a house that you live in that was built after 1990? Come on, raise your hand. There you are. I see you. You're the problem. Tax appraisals. Oh, how about this one? Is there going to be an HEB or is there not? Ooh, what's our EDC doing now, huh? The train tracks, the phantom train, 80 traffic, weekend traffic, school traffic. I mean, it's all in there. But the number one thing we complain about on this We Are Forney is the cities or schools spending tax dollars on stupid stuff. That's the number one thing you see. Perhaps we should change the name from We Are Forney to We Are Angry. Maybe that would be better. <laughs> I'm not sure. People seem to enjoy complaining and criticizing, don't we? And I guess we believe that there's something that feels cathartic about negativity, but quite frankly, it's not just a Forney thing. Criticism is basically an American virtue. You find it all over our society. It is embedded in everything that we do. But here's the question. Is it a virtue? Is it really good? Well, what we're going to do today is look at what God's Word has to say about it, because as egocentric as we are as Americans, the truth is, is we like to think we invented things, but there have been complainers that have been as good as us for over 3,500 years. Because 3,500 years ago, we've got this book called Exodus. It's recorded by this guy named Moses, and he says, during those many days in Exodus 2.23... The people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. So after 400 years of slavery by the Egyptians, 
um, these individuals have recognized that they have gotten to a tipping point. The Egyptians are killing their firstborn children. And so I can't really blame them for crying out because of the injustice that slavery, even to this day. And look at how God responds to their cry in the next verse. It says, their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. So in the very next chapter, we find Moses out tending sheep, and there he stands, shoeless before a burning bush. And God says, go and tell Pharaoh to let the people go. And that's exactly what Moses does. He goes and he lets, he says, let, he says, God tell, is telling you, Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh does. But not, soon, but not long after he does it, that the people are heading out into the wilderness, and Pharaoh changes his mind, so he sends the army after them. And so they get to the Red Sea. Moses holds up his arm. They part the Red Sea. The people go down into the water. They come up out of the water. Their enemies have followed them down into the sea. And when Moses puts down his, head, puts down his hands, they are drowned in the sea, and they are free to walk in the newness of life. Sounds like the first baptism, doesn't it? So you would think at this point, after they've been baptized, they've left their enemies behind them, you'd think that they would just live a life of rejoicing, that they would be happy individuals, but not so. Chapter 16, verse 1, just two chapters later. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the people of Israel said to them, Oh, would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They haven't even lasted three months. And they're like, sure, we were slaves back in Egypt, but at least our bellies were full. And if I'm Moses, I've got to be thinking, you can't possibly be serious. You were slaves in Egypt. You were groaning to God, begging him to set you free from slavery, and now you are grumbling and complaining that you have been set free? Can you believe this? Well, you probably can if you have kids, right? I mean, for some of you, for nine months, you had a kid that complained about going to school, getting up every morning early. For nine months, they complained about it. They have now been home three days, and they will not stop clamoring about how bored they are. <laughs> am I wrong? I don't think I am. I, um, this uh, past summer, we don't have, you know, our, our family, we have two kids already out of the house, and so we've got three still at home. One just graduated yesterday or Friday. And, um, and so, so last summer, we took the three youngest, and my wife and I, um, and we planned a family vacation. You know, you don't have as many of those as you probably think you're going to have. Um, and, you're, you know, I know we're going to miss it one day. And so um, we went down to San Antonio, and we, we drove down there, and we were, got five nights in a VRBO. And uh, we were down there in San Antonio. And uh, it was, uh, we, we went and we spent full days, and I think we were three days into it. I'm not exactly sure, but I think we were three days into it. And we were, we were playing pool. This VRBO had a pool table in it. And so we had had a really busy day, and it was kind of, you know, eight-ish, eight or so o'clock at night. And, uh, and my daughter, she was just being, being a little turd. Is, is, I, don't know, is that, is that, I don't know that that's really a spiritual thing to say, but uh, <laughs> bad words. Uh, but, <laughs> but she was. And, uh, and so, she's, so, she, she, so basically, my wife's like, you can just go back in your room. And uh, you can just go back in the room that you're staying in, and, and we're going to stay out here and play. And, and so, so she does that. Well, my, my wife's like a, a good parent. You know, I mean, I would, I would let her suffer for overnight. But uh, my wife walks in there to check on her and see how she's doing. And she's like, you know, Sarah, talk to her. And so it turns out that Sarah is mad. Um, she's a seven on the Enneagram, which means she suffers from FOMO, which means a fear of missing out. And so she is always missing out on things, anything that's going on. She's always not, not always concerned with what's happening now. She's concerned with what's happening next because she's always wondering what other people are doing and could it possibly be better. And so um, she's, like, she's like, I'm here in San Antonio on this stupid vacation in this house. Don't even have a car here. And all my friends are eating at Brahms. <laughs> Do what? We just paid for a full day for five people at SeaWorld. And then we ate at Papa Do's afterwards. I guess it gave us a hankering for seafood being at, being at SeaWorld all day. I don't know. <laughs> is, that, is that improper to say? I don't know. feels like I probably shouldn't say that. Sorry to all of you online. Don't send us emails. We're just kidding. Um, 
<laughs> but, uh, but, you know, at, but we, we'd go to, and, I, and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. All day SeaWorld, fine dining at Papa Do's. And you're complaining that you're not at Brahms? Have any of you had the food at Brahms? <laughs> Am I missing something here? I mean, but, but, but I, and don't you hate that when, when it seems like you're being gracious to your children, but yet they're ungrateful? That's exactly what's happening right here. But here's what's funny is God's better than I am. He gives them manna. Every morning he says, I'll send them fresh bread from heaven. Should be no complaints now. Plenty of food, as much as they can eat. Next chapter, they're grumbling at Moses again. Exodus 17, 3, but the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And then in Numbers chapter 11, which is recounting the same story again, they're complaining. And you know what they're complaining about? They're complaining about the manna. I mean, manna was great at first, but now they're sick and tired of it. It's like somebody that goes on a cruise or an all-inclusive resort and they're tired of eating buffets all the time. You're like, get over it. And they're like, they're like, manna, 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 I'm sick and tired of manna. That's all I ever get is manna. Manna sandwich. Manna toast. Manna milkshakes. That's all I ever eat is manna, 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 sick and tired of manna. Sound like anybody in your house? Sound like any of you? They're like, we had onions. We had garlic. We could be at Brahms. God starts giving them quail in addition to the manna. I mean, it's complaint after complaint after complaint after complaint of these people. And here's a little side note. We don't want to miss this because in Exodus 16, 2, it says the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses, 17, 3. And the people grumbled against Moses. But look at what it says in Exodus 16, 8. The Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us but against the Lord. And there, my friends, is a powerful truth. The next time you find yourself being negative and complaining, understand that when I grumble and complain, I'm grumbling and complaining against God. Not the city, not the government, not local restaurants. When I'm a negative individual, I'm not talking about having a critical mind. I'm talking about having a critical spirit. There's a difference between the two. Because what complaining does at the end of the day is it reveals a gratitude problem. And I mean, isn't that kind of the same thing? Because you can't really be complaining, uh, you know, and grateful at the exact same time. And if you're not grateful, it reveals that you have taken your eyes off of the goodness of God. Listen, let me be clear. You can't be complaining and grateful at the same time because you're only grateful when you are really looking at the goodness of God. It will be easy to complain if you take your eyes off of that. Sure, life in the wilderness wasn't perfect, but they had so much to be thankful for, so much that God had done for them. In Egypt, they were slaves. They didn't have control over their lives. And what I'm saying to you today is, is that God delivered them from that and he has delivered you from where you have been. Listen, if you ever question whether or not God is on your side, you should, have been, have, you should not have to do anything more than to look to Calvary and see the cross where he died for your sins. And if he does not give you another thing in the rest of your life, if he does not give you one more breath, you have received more than you actually deserve. And it's that kind of gratitude, that kind of focus on the goodness of God that changes everything. And listen, I'm telling you, it's okay. They could have prayed for water. They could have asked for water and meat. It's okay to do that. But I think it should have been, first of all, God, big thanks for all that you have done for us, how you have miraculously provided. You have brought us to walk in the newness of life. Listen, it's not unbiblical to want better in various aspects. And listen, I pray this all the time. If you are in the hospital and I come to pray for you, I want you to know I'm going to pray a big, bold prayer. I'm going to stand before God, and I'm not going to just ask for you to just be able to endure the suffering. I'm going to pray that God is going to bring about complete and total healing in your life. That's what I'm going to pray for. But I'm going to pray it with the understanding that God has already given to us in his sovereignty more than we deserve and is planning to take what I'm going through right now and redeem it for his glory and our good. I know there's plenty to complain about. I mean, when I start thinking about the evil in our world, I start thinking about worldwide injustice, the mismanagement of our government, 
the state of education, the economy, two straight years without an Alabama national championship. I mean, there's a lot of things to be upset about. What's going on? You see, what happens is we get our focus on the wrong things. So the very next day, um, after Sarah is complaining about being on vacation, I'm driving there through northwest San Antonio, frustrated with how their construction has created a traffic log jam. And I'm griping to my wife about it. I'm like, I'm paying all this money to sit in traffic. I could do that in Dallas. I'm like, do, do you even hear yourself, Griffin? You're on vacation. God has given you enough money and enough time and a family that you can enjoy this with. And here you are in a city that's not even your own complaining about the traffic patterns. You're not even in a hurry. My wife's like, you're impatient. I'm like, no, I'm just efficient. You know, <laughs> try that next time. But, but, in, but in this moment, and, and thankfully, like this, and thankfully I have these moments when it's like God grabs me by the shoulders and he reminds me what Jesus said. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And the problem for many churches and many pastors is we only talk about the overcoming and we never share with people that there are things that have to be overcome. You see, there are things that will not go right in your life. I am not telling you that everything is perfect in the wilderness. I'm not trying to tell you that everything is sunsets and rainbows. It's not like that at all, man. But if you've given your life to Jesus, you have been forgiven of every wrong that you have ever done, and God will make all things right. He will redeem all things. He will actually, I believe from when I read the text, he'll reverse the things that feel like injustice around our world. And that's enough reason to be really joyful for the rest of our lives. We don't want to have that critical spirit. We can have a critical mind, but when we have a critical spirit, the problem is we are living by sight and not by faith. That's how the world does it. They actually make a decision as to how they feel based upon what they see happening right in front of them. But that's not how we function. We operate knowing that God will make all things right in the end. We operate in faith. And so our lives should be characterized by people that trust in the goodness of God to make everything right in the end. You see, that's faith. Faith is the conviction of things unseen. And it may be bad, but somehow or another it can be redeemed. And I know it's a mess. I was a mess, but God redeemed me. God has been working on me, redeeming parts of me. He's been conforming me to the image of the Son. Thank God that he has a vision to see me for more than I was. And the worldly person, man, they complain and criticize, but the person of faith talks about what could be. This is the biblical way. But apart from being biblical, it's also way, you know, it's way more effective you ever paid any attention to the, to the um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech? Have you paid any attention to that? Maybe one of the most powerful speeches on record. And it was addressing um, an incredibly evil and wicked problem of systemic racism in our country and around the world. But what's interesting is if you look at it is that Dr. King doesn't spend any time talking about what is. Instead, he spent all his time talking about what could be. He didn't chastise the country for what it was doing. He painted a picture for how beautiful it could be on the other side. And if you listen to it, it's, I mean, it's an indictment on our country, no question. But if you listen to it, you won't feel condemned and hopeless. You will feel hopeful. You will feel inspired. And you're like, well, so we should just leave it alone. No, you shouldn't leave it alone. Don't pretend like everything is sunshine and rainbows. That's not what I'm saying at all. The world is broken and fallen, and every person has massive limitations. Every organization, including this church, is made up of flawed individuals. So two things. Let me just give you a couple things. Got to get to it here. Two things you can do with this. First of all, just write these down. If you can change your circumstance, do it. If you can change your circumstance, do it. If you see problems and you can do something about it, don't just sit around and complain. If you have a vision for how things could be, go bring your vision to life. Pastor Irma Manis, I wrote down this quote. He said, the most powerful form of criticism is creation. I love that. If you have a vision for how things should be instead of criticizing what is, why don't you go create what should be? So this is really kind of built into the fabric of our church um, so Randy, Paul, and I were all friends and did camps together and things before we founded Community Life Church 17 years ago. And, um, 
and we, we would gather together on a regular basis and we would solve the world's problems and basically figure out all the things that our churches were doing wrong. Now, there were a lot of factors that went into this, but I'll tell you one thing is, is that God put a holy discontent on our heart, and we began to ask the question at an event called Catalyst in Atlanta. We began to ask ourselves the question, can what God is putting on our heart be accomplished in the place where we currently are? And God gave us a resounding no. It was kind of pretty definitive. And when the door slammed, I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to just follow his prompting and build what God had placed upon our hearts. It's his building. It's his church. You're his people. We're just going to steward it. And that's how we got to where we are today. And sometimes I'll sit down with lunch with somebody and they'll be sharing all this thing that's going on in their life and I will recognize that same holy discontent and I'll look them in the face and I'll say, sounds like you need to start a church of your own. And I listen, and I bless you, I support you, I release you, you go do whatever it is that God has placed upon your heart. I am a fan of that. And if God tells you to do it, you better do it. People say, I don't want to be a church hopper. I'm like, well, you can hop all you want to as long as God's the one who tells you to hop. You see, the smartest person in the room is not the person that can point out why everyone else's plan won't work. Isn't that the issue? I mean, you know who that is at work, right? I mean, they're always taking shots at what everybody else says what everybody else thinks, but they're not willing to build anything of their own. Listen, I have some complaints, and most of them, you know, most of them do center around traffic. But listen, I, w- I wouldn't want to run for mayor or city council because I refuse to complain about it. I mean, I'm not going to refuse to complain about problems that I'm not willing to solve. You got a problem with something, then get out there and fix it. Do something about it. I do this sometimes. Um, a few weeks ago, there was an issue over at Samuel Farm. Uh, there was a homeless camp that had apparently developed there um, in Samuel Farm. And someone from our church in the Sunnyvale campus calls and says, hey, there's a lot of chatter, a lot of slamming of the police, a lot of slamming of, of you know, city government, and whether it be Dallas County, the county judge, just all this stuff. Because there's, you know, dis- there's some discrepancy as to who's supposed to be responsible for this. And... Uh, This person was like saying, we need to stop all these people from being negative. And then I realized, you know what? I'm not going to be negative about the situation. I'm not going to be negative about the people that are being negative either. So I called uh, called Rocky up, our campus pastor, our online campus pastor. Shout out to you, you guys out there. Um, And we went to Samuel Farm and we spent an hour and a half walking around in the mud looking for this homeless camp to see if we could find these people so we could find a way to bless them and minister to them. Now you can sit around and complain about it all you want to or you can get up and do something about it. When you can change your circumstance, do it. If you're going to talk about the problem as a believer in Jesus Christ, you should be a part of the solution because you have the redemptive power of Jesus at your disposal. So secondly, and this is the final thing today, if you can't change your circumstance, change your perspective. You don't always have control of your circumstances. There are times when you have no control over the problems and situations that you find yourself in, but you always have control over your perspective. Philippians 2.14 says this, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Your translation may say complaining. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, same author writing a different letter to a different church, says rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Can I just tell you today that I, I can't make you a promise that your life is going to get easier. It wasn't until recently that I realized why I had such a hard time when people would ask me, has the church gotten harder? And the answer is always yes. Pastoring the church that's bigger is harder. And I always felt guilty answering that way. But something can be harder and better at the exact same time. So yes, it's harder. But yes, it's better. I'm a parent. Parenting is harder. But it's also better. 
being a boss is harder, but it's also better. I'm just here to tell you today that what God has been teaching me over the course of the last year is, is that even though your life may get harder, it may not get easier. It can still get better because we've got a God who is a redeemer and is taking everything. And this is the perspective that will basically be the umbrella over everything I think and do. That God is redeeming it, building upon it, conforming me to the image of the Son. The guy who wrote both these verses is a guy named the Apostle Paul, and he didn't just talk the talk. I mean, he walked the walk. I mean, from the day that Jesus saved him on the road to Damascus, man, he was spreading the gospel, and he dealt with a lot of stuff. He talks about it in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from ro robbers, in danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger Will Robinson, no, sorry, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, and without food and cold and exposure. And I know what you're thinking, Paul is complaining. No, it's exactly the opposite. He is boasting in these things because they have exposed his weakness, and these super apostles running around out there at these other churches are claiming that everything is going well, that their ministry is being blessed. They're driving around with, and they're driving around in private jets. And they're like, see how much God has blessed me. And Paul said, let me tell you how much God has blessed me. He has put me in horrible situations. And quite frankly, that passage we read a moment ago about do all things without grumbling and complaining is a part of a book called the book of Philippians, also known as the book of joy. And you know how he began this book? written ironically enough while he's in prison i want you to know brothers he says in philippians 1 12 that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for christ and most of the brothers have become confident by the lord in my imprisonment and are much more bold to speak the word of god without fear yeah, it's not the best accommodations I've ever stayed in, but it's actually promoting the gospel. Paul's like, yeah, they, listen, I'm chained to a Praetorian guard, but a Praetorian guard is also chained to me. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I've got a captive audience, and what do you suppose they talked about? I'll give you three guesses, and the first two don't count. They talked about Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Paul is saying it's clear that even though things are not going my way, that I have a completely different perspective than those on the outside. And on top of that, because old Paul's not out there preaching from church to church, there are other brothers that have been encouraged to speak the word of God more boldly and courageously. And he goes on to say, he's not done, right? He's coming to the end of his life. He recognizes that this imprisonment may well result in his death. And he says, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. That even though it's coming at a great personal cost to myself, and this is really meaningful on a Memorial Day weekend, that you have faith. The book of joy is written by the Apostle Paul. What an amazing perspective. His life wasn't about him. His life was about Jesus. And even though he had plenty to complain about, he recognizes that even in his weakness, even in his suffering, even in his difficulty, that God could overcome, could redeem, and could restore all of it. So uh, this week thinking about this message, I called um, a woman in our church uh, named Kathy Calfee. And Kathy and Jim um, have been a part of our church since we were way back at Claiborne. And uh, been great supporters in so many ways. Uh, Twelve years ago, um, Kathy and Jim moved out east, got some land, started building a dream home, got it completed, and uh, finished the house. Jim retired, was retired about six months. Kathy was moving towards retirement herself, getting very close. And one day, Jim was driving um, to Canton, and, uh, and he had a mini stroke, and his car at 60, 65 miles an hour careened off the road and hit a tree. Very serious accident, but 
she was told that he was supposed to survive. But the next day, he had a serious stroke, a life-altering, debilitating stroke that would change everything. And he would never be the same. His disability would characterize the rest of his days of his life. And everything they planned had kind of gone up in smoke. And I sat there on that phone for 30 minutes talking to Kathy this past week. And not one time did I hear her complain as she told this story. And every Sunday, when it's physically possible, that if she's online, if because physically he can't get there, she'll stay there and have church with him in the living room, and she'll be typing in. And those of you online have probably seen the name Kathy Calfee, but most Sundays she gets him ready, puts him in the car. The two of them drive to this little school we meet, and they spend 10 to 15 minutes trying to get into the worship center, but when she gets into the worship center, she immediately, as one of our prayer partners, begins to pray for person after person after person inside of our church, looking for opportunities opportunities to bless them and each and every time we have any kind of offering I want you to understand they're not just regular givers in our church they call all the time that anytime there's something going on in another country there's a mission here or a mission there or a benevolent need or someone who finds themselves struggling they will ask how can we contribute something to it and I couldn't help but think that these dollars that they intended to use to travel the world for themselves are now being used to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and and she's not complaining while doing it. And I'm just here to tell you that it's a little embarrassing that I'm complaining about traffic from a city I don't even live in. Driving around on vacation in San Antonio, all upset with a God who has given me more than I could ever imagine. How about you? Are you a contented person? Are you a grateful person? Is the goodness of God at the center of your attention? Do you find yourself quickly and often looking back to the cross and refocusing your perspective? Changing it when you can, accepting it when you can't, because God has a plan in His sovereign, redemptive plan to use all of it for His glory and your good. Would you bow your heads with me? I just want to kind of walk you through this for just a second. Just, would you thank God? Let's just start with this one. If you've received Christ, many of you have. Some of you may not. And if you haven't, today can be your day. But would you just thank Him for that? Would you thank Him for that faith that allows you to see forward and see through? And now, would you take a moment and would you find something else? Maybe it's a family thing, a, a work thing. Would you find something else that you are grateful for right now? Just lay them out, one after another. Come on, this should be easy. If we live a life of looking to the goodness of God, we ought to be able to account the goodness of God. There's places we've seen it. Just thank Him for the next breath if you can't think of anything else. perhaps today you, um, you have one thing that's just right in front of you and you're thinking about it regularly and you're having a really hard time being grateful for this would you just pray and thank God that you have faith that one day it will be taken care of will you trust him will you praise him Will you look to the goodness of God? Would you let the cross swallow up whatever it is that stands against you? Father, we know that you see us today. We know that you have paid the price for us. You have given us a faith 
that is far beyond what we could have conjured up on our own. So today, we trust you. We trust your provision. We trust your perspective. And we praise you for who you are. In Jesus' name.